Call the meeting, uh, send the school committee to order, 601. And uh, let's see, we're here with our, we have a new member, Peter Gargarin. So we don't have, uh, let's see, there we have principal, we've got uh, Prince, uh, Principal Barashevsky and Dr. Carey um, couldn't be here this evening, so you have me, uh, Patty Kavanaugh, Director of Business Services, and they're in their place. <laughs> Outstanding. All right. Uh, take a moment to review the minutes of the uh, October 5th. Great. to approve the minutes but November, November, November 14th. 14th. What, what, which minutes are you looking at? Sorry, November 14th. Could I, <coughs> could I just uh, ask for a correction? Sure. Because my name is clobbered. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, in the first, second, third, fourth paragraph, we will correct the spelling of your last name to G A G A R I N. Correct, thank you. That's Do you need a second? A second. Yeah. With a correction? With a correction. Looks good. Oh, all, all in favor? Yep. Oh, I wasn't there. Yeah. Not, not in the official capacity. No, I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wasn't. All right. So, uh, it's unfinished business, or sorry. Um, I had made the request if we could have right. um, the law. The news law. Outstanding. <laughs> so, first we're going to do the uh, MCAS. Yes, we have um, Louise Law, our Director of Elementary Education, here with us this evening, and she's going to talk to you about the MCAS results for Sunderland Elementary School. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for uh, putting me on early in the agenda. Um, so I have a, some handouts that will um, explain. Hi, Louise. I've seen you for a long time. I know. Um, so, in these packets um, are some explanations. As, um, as you may know, the MCAS has changed this year. It has become um, aligned to the new standards in Massachusetts, and it's shifted to an online format. The online format was um, optional for this year for grades three, five, and six. Only fourth graders were mandated to take it online. In our district, we opted for all the kids, every grade, to take it online for two reasons. First of all, we wanted to, um, the this, this state gave us a pass on um, being leveled as a district. Every year you get a level, whether you're level one, level two, level three, based on your test results. That's accountability. We were given a pass if all of our kids would take it. Sunderland does very well. That wasn't a big motivator, but it allowed the te me to say to all of our teachers, for this year, our, our agenda is to teach kids how to take an online test, to get comfortable with that, to work out the glitches because they took them on laptops in their classrooms. If you can imagine eight-year-olds taking an online test in their classroom. And there were a lot of online tools for them to manipulate. So I said, you know, teachers in Sunderland are always very proud of how the kids do and work really hard to prepare them. I said, our, our big focus is shifting to this to get kids comfortable because this is the future of their testing lives. Don't worry as much about the scores. But of course, they did really well in addition to getting accustomed to the new test. So I wanted to tell you just a little bit about it. This is, these are slides, um, some of them modified from the Department of Education. These are now called the Next Generation MCAS or MCAS 2.0. It's updated, the, um, the MCAS has been 20 years old. This is the first major overhaul of MCAS in 20 years. Um, and the focus is the new standards, critical thinking, application of knowledge, and connections between reading and writing. We used to have a writing sample at just fourth grade. Kids would, students would have to write a, a personal narrative. 
Now, every grade includes reading, comparing literature, and writing a comparative essay. Even in third grade, they're writing um, on the computers and comparing um, pieces of literature. That's a new shift. It used to just be writing in fourth grade. Um, the critical thinking, there's writing and um, uh, multi-step problems in math. It used to be one problem at a time. Now there's part A, part B, part C, and referring back to part A to answer part C. Quite rigorous and quite challenging. And um, application of knowledge, reading and applying to a new problem-solving situation. The MCAS has always been um, considered rigorous. In fact, it's the most, it was the most rigorous um, state assessment when you compare it across the states. This has brought it to a new level of rigor. Um, so the next page shows um, only 60% of kids in the state did take the test online. All of our kids did. Um, they're phasing in the computer-based assessment. Um, the past spring, it was only grade four that was mandated. This coming spring, grades four and five will be mandated to take it online. Um, and grade five in science. Past year, this past year, the science in fifth grade was only paper pencil. They weren't prepared with an online version. This year is a shift. So even though it's not mandatory for our sixth graders to do it online, we're going to do it again. Um, again, to get them in the practice because the time, the only time it really counts for students is 10th grade. Um, it counts for schools every grade, but nothing happens to a child's academic life if they don't do well on MCAS. Um, at least in our district, we don't, you know, some schools in some states have retained children in grade because they didn't pass the state test. That's, that's not how we do business. Um, but we do look at students who don't score at a level that um, is meeting the expectations and provide um, the kind of instruction they will need. The shift in achievement levels, no longer, the old language was, you were advanced, proficient, needs improvement, or my least favorite, warning. Um, and so the state got a lot of feedback from educators about that language, and they shifted it to uh, much more standards-based and more growth mindset language. So meeting expectations is the new proficient. You met the state expectations. Exceeding is now the new advance. Partially meeting, which sounds much more encouraging to a child than you need improvement. You partially met it, and that, in fact, is, is more accurate. And then not meeting. So these are the, this is the new vocabulary, and in fact, we've incorporated some of this because we knew this was coming into our report cards. So instead of getting um, uh, an M, we used to call it, um, uh, I forget what we used to call it, M for mastery. mastery. We used mm -hmm. to call it mastery. But that wasn't really accurate. A child who's meeting our expectations isn't mastering the subject. So we've changed it to meeting expectations right on our report card so that there'll be a consistent language for what does it look like when you've met what we expect you to do. Um, so the change, this, at the bottom of the next page, this is what a parent will see when they get their report. So they'll see a number. So here's a sample child, and this sample child got a 541 on math, and that is in the blue, exceeding expectations. 500 is the new cut score for meeting expectations. Um, it used to be uh, 240. So they've shifted the whole scaling, which is new for us. And it's in 30-point increments. So the 500 is where you meet. 440 is the rock bottom. So that's the starting point. How they come up with these numbers, I don't know and can't answer to. But um, 440 and then a perfect score would be a 560. So um, that's what we're shooting for 500 because it is a high standard. In the past, and this is a little out of order at the top, what happened in the old MCAS is, in the state, the number of students who'd reach proficient varied wildly from grade to grade, which actually meant the test wasn't internally calibrated. In other words, it was much easier in 10th grade to get a proficient than it was in 4th grade. 
and you can see how it got easier and easier and easier. The hardest grade to get a proficient was fourth grade in the old MCAS. Why could that be? Well, fourth and eighth grade were the original MCAS years back in 1993 when the first MCAS came out. They always were meant to hold schools to a high standard. They never were meant to be punitive to students or to have a graduation requirement. When NCLB came in, No Child Left Behind, in the year 2002, it, they required, states were required now to take, if they were taking federal funds, to test every student in three, four, five, six, seven, eight in both English and math. So the state had to quickly come up with new tests. So the bar was set at fourth grade, but they didn't make it as challenging to get to proficient. And so it kind of looked like if, if you were a student who was a little above average, you'd be proficient in third grade, needs improvement in fourth grade, proficient in fifth grade, and you'd be uh, advanced in 10th grade, even if you were at the exact same percentile nationally. So that was a problem, because it gave an inaccurate picture of whether students were actually reaching high standards. So now they've internally calibrated. The next page shows what has happened. At the bottom are the old national tests, NEEPs or they're, they're still current, NEEPs, um, which are the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Every year, um, every two years, the, the, um, the National um, Education Department, Federal Education Department, comes in and randomly tests students throughout each state to get a take on which states are ahead, which states are not, because it's the same test. In fact, students at Frontier and students in some of our schools were chosen. They come in and they say, we want 40 students, we'll pick them, because they don't want you to give them their top students. So they just take all the student names and pick randomly students. And this is where, when you read the headlines that Massachusetts is top in the nation in math, in fourth grade and eighth grade, and top in the nation in ELA, it's these tests, because they are random selected with the same test. So the reality of how Massachusetts, which is first in the nation, does on NEEPS is only about 50% of the kids meet the standard. That is a high standard. So now Matt, um, MCAS is calibrated like that. So they're showing this year, at every grade, only 50% of the kids met expectations. In other words, they set a very high bar. Real teachers were involved. In fact, some of teachers in our district were involved in um, several weeks in the summer, looking at test questions and setting the bar for what meeting expectations at the new bar is, setting what, what kind of answers will we accept, what percent proficient. So they've made it more rigorous and now it's internally calibrated. If you meet expectations in fifth grade, you're not going to suddenly think you're advanced as a sixth grader because the test gets easier. Not going to happen anymore. So. What's a little shocking to some people is only half the kids in the state met expectations. And so it used to be a much higher percent of students in Massachusetts made proficient, if you look at the former. So of course, I, I showed you the, the headlines blared out. New tests bring worse scores for Massachusetts students, and only half of students meet MCAS. This is another document I put in there. Scores drop, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, you know. Headlines, But the reality is they recalibrate it. It's, it's, it's no comparison. It's apples and oranges. So I just wanted to show you that when, how it's reported and then what the reality is. So based on all that, how did our kids in Sunderland do? First time out, all the kids taking it on computer. Well, you can see overall all the kids, um, students, 130 of them took it from grades 3, 4, 5, and 6. To the right, in the state is the state average, where you see 42% met and 7%, that's the column on the right, met the standard, about half. In Sunderland, it was 51 and 5, 56% of our third, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, when they took the ELA, met or exceeded the standard, even though they all took it on the computer for the first time. So we were actually really pleased with this, because we were low-keying how you do, 
and putting the emphasis on how to do it. How do you sit down and look at a screen and answer a question using a keyboard when you're eight years old? And then in math, again, you can see the state, and um, district is our school, for, for those of you who are um, new to school committee. In Massachusetts, I mean, in our, quote, district, we're a union, not a regional. So Sunderland's its own district, Deerfield's its own district, Conway's its own district. So I look, at it, it's confusing when it says, how did the school do versus the district, because it's identical, we're our own district. So you can see also in math, 129 students took it. Sometimes there's a little variability because sometimes students move in and out or for various reasons. But um, in that, 48% and we had 60% in Sunderland. Quite pleased with those results for our first time out ever taking it on the computer. And then um, I won't go into the details of the breakdown grade by grade. Oh, and then here's the science, which was the same old. The science test was paper pencil. Only fifth graders took it. It was based on the old standards, and we are now teaching to the new science standards that were just published last April. Um, we've shifted our curriculum, April, April 2016, right? We knew what was coming, we had drafts, so we shifted, and even with teaching to the new standards, the students did better than the average even though the questions were more aligned to the old standards. So overall, Sunderland did very well. This um, next chart shows what is called growth, what the state does, and we pay a lot of attention to growth because what growth shows is how did students do from one year to next compared to students who scored just like them in the grade before. So if you're a third grader and you got a 503, in fourth grade, your growth will be measured against all the other students who got a 503. So say you got a 503, which is just over, per, over meeting standards, and now you scored a 510. But most of the kids who scored 503 just got a 504. You might be in the 80th percentile for your growth because you scored better than 80% of the other kids who scored just like you. So it controls for the difficulty of the test in that way. So they aggregate all these SGP, student growth percentiles, and the performance. X is the state average. And I always think of this picture when I explain it. It's like I'm hitting a baseball. The bottom is, here's where you hit it. This is out of the park. The upper right, it means you scored really high and grew a lot. This is average growth and average scoring. So as you can see, the ball bounced higher, that's the achievement, and we're farther to the um, right <laughs> than the X. So we want to see that. We want to see good growth, no matter how the students score. The, t the place where it's really challenging is our students who score a perfect score, which happens occasionally, and then they're compared to all the other kids who scored a perfect score. So sometimes you get students who score in the top 5% and they're in low growth. But my, my statement about that is someone at MIT got the lowest SAT score. You know, it's just, so sometimes there's an inaccuracy. But when you aggregate, it gives you a good picture. So that's math, and then the same story in ELA, English Language Arts, on the next. You can see the ball bounced higher in achievement and is a little to the right. This is, again, the caveat that all of our kids took it on computer. Most third graders did not. And um, there, was, there were some challenges. We won't say there weren't. Um, and then the rest are, this is, this is just a, 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 sh a shrunk down version of everything I just showed you. It prints out like this. I tried to make it bigger to read. But here's all the data for every grade, and this is the aggregate data. So just the other handouts that I've given you, um, I just wanted to show you what some of the headlines so that when you read them, you can understand that it's a misunderstanding of what's actually going on. Yes, the test scores are lower, but this is the um, press release from the Department of Education from Malden, and it shows the bullets on the back are their talking points, which actually we found quite true. It's a baseline year. New test, can't compare, it's apples and oranges. Um, 
Tenth graders didn't take the new one. They will be moving towards it. They took the old one because it wasn't fair to spring a new test on new standards in a new format when the graduation requirement is based on it. Tenth graders have to pass to get a diploma. And um, they're saying 50% of students, <laughs> this is a way to sell it. Instead of saying 50% of students didn't meet it, 50% already are meeting <laughs> or exceeding the standard. And they're expecting that will go up because this was a brand new format. And once our teachers, and particularly Sunderland teachers, once they understand and know the format, they give students lots of opportunities to practice in that format, to understand the kinds of questions. And it's not teaching to the test, it's teaching to what the standards are asking, comparing literature, asking, answering multi-step problems, um, and really applying what you know. So that's the story on MCAS. And then um, what you'll see is our, quote, report card. This goes, we're supposed to send this out um, or post it on our website every year. It shows what level the school is at. And as you can see, because we opted to take the, the computer version, we didn't get a level. We got a pass on that. Um, but this goes into some detail. Um, the next page is showing the growth that I, that I reported to you, where the average growth and where Sunderland's growth is. So we're pleased. It's a lot of work. It's a rigorous exam. And we're impressed with how well our students adjust to it. And really, they do their best. So we're anticipating the scores will get even better, because now they've had some practice. Oh, I'm so sad. I thought I didn't see that All right. So, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Peter. Um, if we had been given a level, is there any indication what that would have been? Two, two. level two. Um, we were level two last year. Level one, um, you have to meet several requirements, which is you have to um, meet a certain requirement for scoring as well as raising, closing the gap between various um, groups of students and the average. So one is learning disabled students. If the gap is like 15% and you don't close it by a certain amount, you're level two. Sunderland varies between going from level one to level two. We're happy being either level one or level two. It means that we don't get intervention by the state. When you get to level three, you start getting some um, intervention by the state, which maybe is useful, but starts mandating certain things that I think our teachers already do very well. So we'd be level two, as all of our schools are either level one or level two. The, the, the most extreme level, level five, is where the state starts to come up and take over the test, take over the school, I'm sorry, level five. Level four is a lot of intervention. Level three, you get some intervention. They don't consider schools in level one or level two to be having a, a problem, but they're trying to motivate us. Really, our scores are high, but they want schools to close the gap between students who are second language learners and average scores, students who are learning disabled and average scores, students who are um, low income and the average scores. All of the traditionally lower scoring on standardized test groups, the focus now is close that gap. So sometimes the gap is bigger and smaller because we have such a tiny population. So sometimes like in fourth grade, only 22 kids took the test. So if we didn't close the gap between the, and in that grade, you know, there, were, there was a large number of kids um, who were on one of those certain high-risk groups, and if we didn't close that gap, we're level two. And is there a, I mean, could you sort of sum up what the administration's reaction is to our results? I mean, are you satisfied? Are you really pleased? Are you delighted? Or is there a sense of, of you know, we still How, have, you know, whether, you know, to what extent we've done well and to what extent, I mean, obviously you never keep working and you never keep driving to do better, but the sense of, you know, and, and, and my recollection when I was involved in this stuff back on the school council, it's been almost 20 years ago, was that there was also a question of 
you know, you've got kids who come from different backgrounds and have different learning challenges, and depending upon how many of those particular kids are in your very small sample size, it can look like one year you're not doing so well, and the next year you're doing better, and it's just a matter of a different little composition of the kids in the class. But, but there's still, you know, for, for you who are, you know, deeply involved in this and are going to understand this much more than, than we will, is there a sense of, you know, that things are, that things are good or that things are, you know, we got to sort of sharpen up a little bit? Overall, Sunderland way outperforms its demographics. Mm -hmm. So in other words, in testing, um, you look at what percentage of your population is low income, is ELL, has learning disabilities. According to um, even what the, what the state releases, Sunderland, according to its demographics, should score X and it scores above that consistently. Uh, Do we? Uh, yes. That's where I was thinking, but I wasn't thinking. Absolutely, right. and absolutely, and um, we're we're very pleased. By the end of sixth grade, students leaving Sunderland are among the highest scoring in the district, even though it is the highest percent of low income and the highest percent of ELL and the highest percent of students with learning disabilities. We're very pleased with how Sunderland students progress through these quite rigorous exams. Is there work to do? Absolutely. When we look at the challenges of what's being asked of students, it's in our curriculum, but we know we have to sharpen up some of, in math, the, you know, the rigor of how do you answer a multi-part question where part three depends on you answering part one correctly when you're eight. So, you know, teaching kids to have that stamina to stick to it through multi-part questions. We, we analyze it on a much deeper level, of course, with the teachers. We sit down and go, go um, point by point. How do we do compared to state average in, on these kinds of questions, on open response versus, well, now they have a different name, versus the multiple choice. How do we do in uh, algebra versus geometry? So it varies by, by grade where the focus is. But overall, Sunderland deserves to celebrate how well students do on this kind of rigor. Does the state still put out um, basically a ranking of all the cities and towns? And state, state never did that. Well, the, the Boston press Globe, does the it. The Boston Globe did that. The press does it. <laughs> the state is not interested in doing right. that. The press loves to do it. Right, because, but sometimes if there's good news, you know, part of your job is to get the good news out because right. it does matter and people want to feel good about their school. On the other hand, if there's not good news, then we, you know, we don't want to hide that either. Because, Correct. You know, no, it, it, they did very well. I, I didn't look at the rankings because I knew that um, we took it on a computer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, Maybe we scored better than some schools, and also some schools that took it on computer, our kids have good access. Now, next year, I don't want to be too satisfied if we score way better than, say, a high poverty school where there are 10 computers and those kids are being asked to take it on a computer. The state has mandated computer testing but hasn't provided funding for computers. This town supports its educators and supports the schools enough that our students have um, access to technology in a way that supports them being successful. And it's not just testing. A lot of learning is digital now. So we are fortunate, but I'm loath to um, feel great about it if we're being compared to a higher poverty district that can't afford the technology and now, and that children don't have it in their home, and now they're being tested in that environment. So I anticipate Sunderland's going to stay at the top. It's already way up there. I didn't look at the rank order, but I know that we've way outperformed our demographics, and the growth is good, even though it was the first time out on computers. So um, our teachers deserve to feel really good about it. And then this year, it'll be the second time, and we're, now we're going to even look closer, because it's not just teaching them how to take it on computer. We're going to expect certain things were mastered on taking it on the computer. Now we need to focus more closely on making sure the content is, is still up there. But I'm, I'm pleased. I really am. Thank you. I am. Bet Mr. Barshevsky is. I think our, our um, Matt Howell here is our ELL teacher. And our, I will just mention, since he's here, our ELL students, students learning a second language, way outperformed the state average ELL students, 
even though our students, in another language, took it on a computer. Some of them arriving a few weeks before the test from another country. <laughs> so that was, you shuffled to get them ready. You're like, you know, what is a computer? <laughs> how, do you, how do you take it on a computer? Particularly in math. They did very well in math, our second language learners. So that was really exciting. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned that uh, the borrow set where only half the population was north of, you know, meets expectations. Is that going to be kind of an ongoing thing or, or they're going to try to, I understand continuous improvement, you're always not only setting the bar high, but kind of raising it. But like, and I know that I don't know how much insight you have into the future and what's planned for the test. I don't have insight, but what I understand, I'll tell you what I understand from what I've learned from people who are on the, some of the committees that set the bar is the bar is new. So in other words, they looked at test questions, these open-ended questions, and said, what will we accept? That's why only half the kids met it. It's higher. And my guess is they're going to keep it there. And what they're expecting is schools will learn. Like, we've been pretty much on top of whenever a new standard comes out, we're on it. We look at it. We try to. And we have the tools and the support and the lovely library and the staffing to immediately begin to implement those new standards. Other districts, you know, are still struggling to do that. They've set that bar. I anticipate they're going to keep it there because they did a lot of standards setting with big groups of teachers over several weeks this past summer with teachers, real classroom teachers, looking at real samples of student work. That being said, and that's what we're told, that being said, in the past, MCAS, the level of um, proficiency where that bar was, was a movable target. Mm. So in other words, for one year, you might have to get a 72% correct, and you'd meet, be, be proficient. And then the next year in the same grade, maybe they'd drop it to 70 because they didn't set that bar till after they saw the test, which is kind of manipulating the data. So I am guessing that with this one, particularly since it's computer-based, and particularly since they're working with an outside contractor, Pearson, which wasn't supposed to be in on it, but it is, um, I anticipate the bar is going to stay the same and that they are going to want schools to come up to it, and I anticipate that teachers being, you know, interested in having their kids do well will begin to um, create curriculum that will align with what the new standards. And they really, when, in looking, you know, we can't look at the questions, they only released half of them um, because they're going to repeat them. <laughs> and so in looking at the release questions, it's very similar to what we're teaching. It's just... Um, challenging to do it in a testing environment. But I'm hoping it, do, it isn't a movable target anymore because that kept us guessing. And it also made some, some people cynical if indeed you don't set the bar till after you see how the kids do. How does a teacher prepare? Yeah. So they really controlled how many kids pass the test every year, frankly. They did, we didn't, but that, you know. So um, unfortunately, Sunderland, you know, the teachers work hard here, they know their standards, they know their curriculum, they know their students, and we have excellent support for English language learners, for children with learning disabilities, and we, they keep going. So, yeah, question, yeah. Um, there was some worry about how the kids were going to engage with the digital testing, and how what was your sense of how they adapted to it? Versus maybe like because the science one was still pencil science paper. Science was so. still pencil paper. Did you get a was. sense of, did they engage with it? Did they like it? Did they have struggles with it? I, you know, that's, that's a good question. D different teachers reported different things depending on their, the students. Some students who would be students who maybe would get frustrated because it was digital just pressed the buttons and weren't engaging. But those are the same kids who would just fill in whatever dot. For some struggling kids, it was more fun, they said, because if you don't know the answer, it's more fun to press a button than fill in a dot. Fun wasn't what we wanted to hear. So for some students, they disengaged, and, we, and that was, the teachers were stepping back and just watching what was happening. We're not allowed to intervene. We're not allowed to say, hey, slow down. We're not allowed to say anything. So for some teachers, they were really frustrated. They couldn't, because they could tell somebody was just clicking through. Some students, um, 
enjoy, they said they enjoyed it more because it was, kids are engaged with screens. And also they could click, there were all these cool tools, like you could pull down a ruler and measure. You know, instead of using an actual ruler, you could have a digital ruler and spin it. And so we had to, um, we did some trial runs because we didn't want the kids to spend the whole day having fun with the tools. There were cool tools, like you could change the color of the background screen to read the print on. Well, that was an adaptation because for some learners, white screen with black print, their eyes can't adjust well. But for some students, that was a fun game. Let's make it green on this page. Let's make it. So we learned what we, um, how to help everyone focus. Whenever you're given any kind of assignment, as you know, as an educator, some kids are going to be into it and some aren't. But at some point, you know, kids do try their best. And that's, you know, the teachers say, just do your best. We know you can do this. They psych them up. And we get good results. So, um, you know, there's different, it depends on the child. And then just, uh, are there any, um, I'm sure you started having meetings going over the data. Are there any um, next steps or thoughts for either any grade level or what, like how, basically the unanswerable question, like how do you get that? not meeting to begin to target them to, to bring them up, to close the gap? Well, one thing is um, we are practicing more with a digital climate in a testing situation. Part of it is that. Some curriculum areas we're revisiting. You know, how much are we connecting writing and reading? We already were, but there's more comparative literature. And what we saw a lot of was there's a poem and then a piece of informational, informational text. And students had to glean from both and pull evidence out of them to come up with some kind of thesis about the similarities of these two texts. A lot of times, for whatever reasons, teachers traditionally leave poetry till spring. And that would happen after the MCAS. So we're making sure we're getting poetry in sooner so students can interpret a poem on a testing situation. Because it's usually, you know, April is National Poetry Month. and We've already taken the MCAS. So there was good um, reason for doing that, but now we're inserting it sooner. Geometry also tended to be a spring project, so we're trying to get that in sooner. So looking at the content of the test, the challenge is it's a year's worth of content being tested in end of March. So how do we get it all in and do it in a way that makes sense educationally for kids? And I'd rather sacrifice a few questions on the MCAS and have curriculum that makes sense than try to jam it all in because we're so worried about MCAS. So it's a balancing act. But again, we're, we're, in, a situ we're in a fortunate situation because the kids do well and we're not under the magnifying glass of the state. If we have an off year, sometimes the teachers will say, well, of course, we didn't do well in geometry. I didn't teach it yet because <laughs> it's in May that I do that unit. So that's, you know, and then they look at me saying, so should I teach it in February? Well, how are we going to, you know, should we sacrifice those questions because we're going deeper with number? And that's the, that's the dilemma we have, is how do we, how do, we do it in a way that um, the students will do well, but we're still teaching in a way that makes sense for kids. And I think there's a good, my son almost figured it out, I think. <laughs> so, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks for all the support you give the schools. That's big. All right. Financial uh, statements and sign warrants. Yes. So I emailed you the financial report, and you have nine warrants tonight uh, to sign in the, in the amount of $66,648.57. Um, what I would like to focus on tonight in, in the financial report, um, the capital requests are due to the town. They were due earlier in the month, but our meeting was until tonight. And there are two projects we would like you to consider uh, having us um, submit to the town. Uh, one of them is the ongoing hot water heater. When, when this building was built, the hot water heater, um, the hot water tank was put in uh, to, for 100, 1, 1,730 gallons because we, we put in showers for locker rooms and we've never used them. What we use our hot water for primarily is kitchen food prep, 
um, at sinks, laboratories, and we um, waste a lot of energy because we're, our, our tank is so big. So we've looked at this a couple of different times by a couple of different uh, Siemens looked at it, Bales Energy, and they've all um, had costs uh, in excess of 30,000. Uh, over the last year, there's new high efficiency condensing domestic hot water heaters. We installed both at Frontier and at Deerfield at a cost of about 15,000. Um, Mr. Lesko is recommending that we put this in. Um, we could do uh, a very similar installation here at Sunderland, and he believes the cost would be approximately 17,500. And overall, we would have some. Um, energy costs and some overall efficiency if we did that. So we would like to submit to the town of Sunderland a capital request in the amount of 17.5 to replace the domestic hot water heater. Um, and then the second project we would like to, I have um, a handout here for you. Um, the second project we would like to submit is to uh, improve our video uh, surveillance system here at the school. Our camera quality is very poor and makes recognition difficult or almost impossible. So this picture you're seeing, it looks like a shadow. That's what we see when we let someone in the building. We cannot see their face. Um, on the back is the uh, cost estimate of about um, around $14,000 for the software licensing, adding three new outdoor cameras, five indoor cameras, um, having the server and having the system in, in, installed. So these were two projects we felt uh, for the safety and security and the energy efficiency of the building that we should consider sending to the town. So we would just like your blessing to do that and we will fill out the paperwork and move forward with that. So on the video system here, there's also involving that as an ongoing fee for software licensing, I assume, that's an annual fee? Yes. Are there any other ongoing fees? I don't believe so. They, 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 if we then had to, there'd be ongoing fees if we decided to add more cameras in more areas. Right, but just the regular operating cost. Correct. And on the Hot water heater? Mm-hmm. What size hot water heater does that get you? Um, he says it's 1,730 gallons. That's the old one or the that's new one? one? That's the one we have. That's yeah. over, with, what, that, what are we gonna get? It's an oil, that's an oil-fired domestic hot water, greatly oversized. Um, he didn't say. It doesn't say what the new one would be. I mean, just in terms of taking that to the, you know, the town, uh, you say there's savings to offset the cost. Is is this really what's driving it? Is there a payback time or a sense of the dollar value of the savings? Or is it just old enough it needs to be replaced? It's coming to the end of its life cycle okay. uh, anyways. So that's, what, that's what's driving the... Right. Okay. Right, but... I mean, I think what... I mean, you're sort of saying that we don't have... Again, I'm not a mechanical person, okay? But I just look at this and... Um, you're saying our requirement or demand for hot water is much less than what the current system Correct. would provide. So, so we, I assume we're getting a significantly smaller hot water heater Correct. system. And then I'm thinking that's a lot of money for some hot water system that isn't actually going to have to do that much. And I'm thinking how big the hot water system is in my house. And I don't know how much bigger, you know, we're, gonna, we're asking for here, but the one in my house sure don't cost anything like 17000 um, and I just... This is just a rough estimate. Well, a rough estimate, yeah, but a rough estimate of something that just seems like a whole lot of money for something that's just providing hot water for sinks and, and, and kitchen prep. Mm -hmm. Well, we... Uh, uh, I mean, I don't know, I just... We're just saying it's coming. We've talked about the size of this domestic hot water heater before. And now it's coming to the end of its life cycle, and it could fail unexpectedly. Deerfield's just failed unexpectedly. It cost us $14,000, unbudgeted, to put a new hot water heater in. The same thing happened at Frontier. So we're trying to be oh, I don't, I don't, I don't object to that at all. I would just like to have a, um, a, a more of a feeling that 
somewhere along the line here, and maybe it'll happen when it gets to the, is this going to the Capital Planning Committee? Yes. Okay, when it gets to there, that somebody is going to really look at what it is we're trying to buy here and really look at, 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 at whether it's, it's what makes sense, um, which, you know, I just look, I just, just my gut feeling is that it's an awful big number for something that you're saying that's, you know, we, 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 we need less of a water heater than what we got now. I, I'm absolutely in favor of doing something. It's just that where along this process does somebody well, the company, knows something the take a hard look at the thing? Well, well, the companies that have looked at this before um, repla re recommended replacing the existing heater with solar or wood pellet systems and that was those proposals for those systems cost in excess of thirty thousand dollars that were going to be funded. So we're saying, okay, we're not going to do a wood pellet. We're not going to do solar. We're going to do a regular hot water heater, and at the most, it'll be seventeen thousand dollars, not thirty grand. I mean, do you guys know anything about this sort of stuff? As an engineer and someone with like uh, engineering background, I. I get the idea that, you know, if you have a great big tank that you heat up, then you can drain it quickly and, you know, refill it over time. So if you have a high peak usage thing, uh, like a meal prep or what have you, it makes sense to have a larger tank. But at some point, you, they also do the stuff where it's like, you heat as you go. The water passes through something right. and kind of heats it on right the on fly. Demand. On demand. Exactly. Right. Um, I don't have a sense of, of how many gallons that is appropriate for this or, but uh, I, I, kind of, I see both sides of this. I remember when the fire chief asked for a new fire engine, he had a whole breakdown of how he'd done the shopping and the cost comparison mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I get, I, certainly I would expect the town would, would want some data on, uh, I get that you could do solar and pellets for 30K. Mm -hmm. um, but just, you know, here are the specs, here are the, uh, uh, the different people we sent it out to quote and what they came back with. I mean, we're just coming up with some rough estimates so that we can make capital requests and they will when when they get into the capital pipeline it, it's very what happens mr gagarian is that we have to go try to get these estimates by looking online because we don't have money so no one's going to come in and give us a price when they know we don't have money so you have to get it sort of semi-approved and then they'll come in and they'll give you an estimate so we're 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 you know shooting saying we think 17.5. We think the cameras would be 14 grand. Once we know we have funding, we go through the whole bidding process. What's the timing on it to, to get it to capital planning? They, they were due a week, like two weeks ago, but our meeting was until tonight. But the 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 the, the longer term planning is this essentially if it goes in there. If they approve it at whatever level they might approve it at, then it eventually ends up going to town meeting for approval. Correct. In April. Mm -hmm. Correct. In then April. I then we'll have better data. Okay. I mean, I just I'm we're reluctant to you know say fine with the number when we don't know a damn thing about the number. And I don't know, in all honesty, because again I'm new here, that uh, you know to what extent the system that the that the administration uses to research something like that, whether it's a sort of, Christ, we need a number, you know, put a number down on a piece of paper and set it in there and it'll get worked out later, or, yeah, we really know what we're talking about here. Well, we just, we just, we and maybe, it's, maybe it's not important, maybe we just want to get on the agenda. Right. Okay, at which point it's like, we need a new water heater, and here's one, you know, I mean, I would almost, I mean, I'd be willing to say, okay, submit it, but say, you know, the, the, the dollar amount is, is yeah, so for sure got to be figured out. He's but, basing you know, we just want to get on the list for this is something that needs to be taken care of this year. And that's what we're doing. And he's basing his pricing on we just replaced Deerfield for 14 and we just replaced Frontier for a little bit more than I think maybe 20. Because but those are both bigger schools and Frontier's got showers. Right. So I think he's going in the midline of what the two schools we just spent and said if we replace it, it'll probably be around 17.5. It'll probably be less than 17. I would sure hope so. I would sure think that if you couldn't do that for under five, you'd be not Oh, it right won't now. be five. Well, I'm just thinking about how big a hot water heater you need, and, and uh, I don't know. I'm just, whatever, but but obviously we got to move the process along, so. Um. So if you want to take a vote on that, make uh, a motion. Exactly. To a motion. 
for one at a time? A motion to submit to the you want, do, yeah. do you want to do the projects okay. together or do you want to do them separate? Uh, do them separate. It doesn't okay. hurt to ask. All right. So a motion to send a request to capital planning uh, for a new hot water heater. Yes. Do we should we put the price in or the the estimate? No, because because we, we, he may still want to you know tighten this up before okay. we submit it, which is going to be by Friday. <laughs> and what actually are we required to submit? Uh, there's some forms. We just got to say what the project is and what we think the cost is going to be. Okay, but we don't have to uh, submit like uh, some sort of more formal cost estimate process or something like that. Not that I'm aware of. Is there a second to submit the motion for the hot water? I'll second. And a vote. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. So 3-0. I'll abstain. You're, you're going to abstain? Yeah. Okay. And make a motion to send a request for a uh, replacement video surveillance system. Discussion? Or um, do we know how many cameras we're adding? A uh, few, but it, it, there would be three outdoor and five indoor. It's on the back where it says quantity. Right, but what do we have now? Like, what are we adding? Do we have two outdoor? He doesn't tell me how many he's got. It's got a, like okay, so we've got uh, three outdoor, five indoor on the price. Breakdown, cost breakdown. Right, but that's not what we have now. That's true. That's more than what we have now. It looks like just we probably right have three more. right now because they're giving us three pictures. I know we have Only one at the front door. I know we have one on the pl on the playground. And everything that we have right now will be, in effect, replaced. Correct. The, the, what we have right now is oh, he's saying is older analog technology, and now we would be using higher resolution cameras with pixels. And then the oh, the ones we have right now cannot adjust to the varying light conditions. And then the positions of the cameras are not ideal and obstructed by trees, door frames, and other obstacles. No, I got. I mean, I got this is. I mean, if this is the pictures we're getting, you might as well not have a system. Yeah. Right. And assuming that we need a system, which I think is, most is, is, is the case, then clearly something has to be done. Well, so is there a second to the motion? Yeah, is there a motion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll second that. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 I'm just unhappy with this whole costing process. And I'm not, I, obviously things going forward, and it's just something I'm not going to worry about anymore now, but at some point I'll ask again in terms of, because I'll go ask at the folks at Capital Planning and see what they want from us, okay? And do they want school people to do a bunch of this research or do they feel they're more equipped to do it? Or, you know, is there, is there some way that that ought to be working? Now, maybe it's working just fine now and maybe they're happy at which point I'll shut up and go, you know, go away, but I'm... I, I think that I'd like to check with them and see what, what they're looking for too and if they're either happy or unhappy with what they're getting from us. Because I think that doing this stuff, okay, to take care of the building is really important. Okay, I'm absolutely in favor of like doing the stuff, yeah. okay? It's like, you know, the worst mistakes you make are keep putting stuff off because you're always short of money and the thing you always put off is maintenance, okay, mm -hmm. until it, you know, jumps up and bites you. And so I'm absolutely in favor of, of taking care of this stuff. So were you voting yes or abstaining? I'm abstaining on, on this one too, just about the process. Okay, thank you. But I just want to make clear that yeah, yeah, we've got to move forward on this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Communication, further communication can't hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I look at it that uh, we can put a request in that can always be denied. Uh, there's no harm in putting a request in and that they are probably more equipped to deal with the specs of this than right. But if we think it's important, then we've got to be ready to really make the case for it. Oh, absolutely so that it gets up there so you don't have 
again, it's, it's a problem we ran into, again, when I was doing the finance committee all the time. It's like, it's so easy to say, okay, well, you know, they probably won't go for it, so don't tell them about it, okay? And you really want to know, you know, what are the things that are, you know, if it was your own house, would you be fixing it? Yeah, you know, sure would. Well, if you would fix it in your own house, you ought to be fixing it in your school. And that's all I have for financial report. And who's, who's the cognizant person for the looking at? Is it IT who's doing Yes, that? it's Scott Paul, our, our IT director, Scott Paul. Let me drop him on. Okay. Uh, I just got questions about the um, occupational physical therapy and the on finances. What page is it on Keith? Page 8. Page 8. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is our revol our, our revolving um, account for our special education program, mm -hmm. and um, I'd have to check to see why pe why we're charging salaries there um, rather than um, it could be a coding issue with the payroll. So I will check into that for you. All right, and then just. On the previous page, I just see big numbers sometimes. Uh, the regular IAs is 37.5. So the, 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 here's the thing with the IAs. We budget them now in December. So I take everybody who's in a position and I code them. And then over the summer, everybody's in a different position okay. when we come back in school in September. So as long as my bottom line is under, I don't care because I've got I've budgeted 12. There's 12 there. If they're regular or sped, I'll figure it out before the end of the year. But no one ever ends up in the same position than what where they were the previous December. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's it's a principal prerogative, and I just live with it. Okay. It's you know especially it's, the way he wants to use them too. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. You know he finds that there's better matches. You yeah. know like by you know, springtime he'll he'll he may notice that someone's really good working in the math classes. Right. So then he pulls them out of working with the English, uh, the English language teachers, and pushes them in during the math period. And like I said, it's and then the, that will change the coding. It it, 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 it does. Okay. Yes. That's all I got. Mm -hmm. Public comment. Seems we don't have any public. All right, it's, uh, unfinished business. Well, the uh, update on the school committee uh, member vacancy. We filled. Yeah. Yes. Peter. Yeah. Gargarin here, as we've already mentioned, and superintendent goals. So I'll, I pass those out to you. They're at your place, and you need to vote on them. We need to vote. Um, the way it's supposed to be is, is have a motion first and then discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can, they were sent out a little while ago. Yeah. Yeah. I think you can make a motion and then have a discussion yeah, exactly. and then get a second and then vote. I'm with that. All right. So I'll do a motion to approve the superintendent goals. And, the, and a second? Okay. Discussion? Uh, Patty, can you answer all the superintendent's goals? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you answer all Lynn's goals for me? No, I was not part of the process. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess just for the record, I would say that um, I had some just questions about her student achievement goals. Nothing negative. It was more just some questions on the process. But just as a statement, um, one of the areas that I recommended last year, um, Dr. Scary, Dr. Terry's evaluation was an improvement in communication, and I tried to give some uh, recommendations, maybe how it could be done. And I, I would 
say that I, I've seen a, a definite uptick and improvement in the amount of communications. Um, and then I like the um, some of the ideas that she's put down in the newspaper articles, two a month, I think is what she said. I like that concept. I would wonder if it's, I haven't, I'm not a regular subscriber to a newspaper, so I don't know if it's actually happening and I'm wondering what the effect of it is. And then um, I was gonna ask about the bi-weekly or the, the, the monthly letter to families because we're getting the bi-weekly newsletters and then because of kids we're getting the monthly stuff and then I'm getting a lot of emails from that. So I feel like I get inundated. I can't tell a lot of, a lot of times when it's the monthly, like what the parents are getting. So I'm just wondering how I was going to, I would ask Lynn how effective she thinks it's, it's working for her at this point. But simply put, uh, I think the recommendations I gave her last year, she has tried to act upon. So I, I, I'm happy with the goals as they stand. So she gets a pushback uh, on some of her goals at a previous meeting. Uh, she has to put together a subcommittee to sit down with her. I was on that. Uh, and I get part of where she's at is she wants some, of course, it's the end of the year stuff that's not that far away. And it's in some sort of uh, mid year uh, evaluation in March. So uh, it's one of those things you have to, you have to mark the target before you uh, fire the gun. So she's really looking to at least get some approval this year, I think, mm -hmm. for what she sketched out. But I think there's definitely, uh, especially, you know, through whatever meeting, through the subcommittee, there's opportunities to, to really shape the following year's stuff uh, much more closely. And of course, one thing she's always uh, said is, you know, we're the school committee, part of our job is to evaluate her performance, and we're not strictly limited as far as these goals, mm -hmm. but definitely, uh, as you start thinking about what should they be out, I think it's it's already time to start thinking about next year's goals. You know, get mm -hmm. these uh, get this target hung up on the wall uh, so she can aim for it mm -hmm. and uh, start thinking about. It's it's never too early to think about what uh, you want to see going forward, both for the format of how it's presented and the content. So you had a hand in helping to, to this con or this, this yeah, format. Yeah, it started out. She she had the format, and and uh, a few of us went over the content a little bit. But again, it was one meeting under the gun, and it's it feels like the kind of thing that you meet more regularly. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, mm -hmm. this is to get this up on the on the wall. And I think there's more work to be done. Like I, I look even this first page. You know, I, I see there's the letters A C E and A D. I'm not sure that any of that. There's some structure here that I don't think necessarily is, is abundantly clear to people. You can read the words and they kind of sound good, but... That stuff... Because this I, comes from the yeah, state. Yeah, yeah exactly. So their, I, I don't, you know... Yeah. I get hit over the head with that stuff, so it's, a, it's abundantly clear to me. I can see where she's getting it from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's getting it from the state. Okay. <laughs> um, there's a ton of different standards and, and it, it's, it's like a, it looks like a lunch menu and a lot of times it's overwhelming. It, 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 there's like too much to pick. There's too much to, to draw from. Sometimes it... it, yeah. it it pays to have a very uh, simple, clear vision of a couple of areas that you want to target. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I definitely got that sense that... Uh, but your group is an ongoing group? Your goals? I mean... Group, or is it a one-time? Let's put it this way. It, it was a one-time, and I know we're talking about uh, meeting again, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it should, especially, uh, you know, to get this the process ironed out, because that strikes me as useful to exactly. say that a little, a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, 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 the student achievement goal and like all the SMART goals, these are exactly, mm -hmm. I mean, it's the same stuff that I have to do. Right. Any additional discussion? All, all in favor? I feel hard voting on it because I really just yeah, got yeah, it. You just so got it. Yeah. That's, that's Fair enough. Can we go back for a second? Because sure. uh, uh, Keith, your question on page eight, mm -hmm. they, the, the budget line, if you look, we're 46 cents over. The, 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 the budget is in the top two lines and the actual salaries are hitting the bottom two lines. So it's just a coding issue. Okay. So we're not over. We're over 11 and we're, we're over 11,004 and then we're under 11,003. So we're off like a buck. Okay. So it's just, I'll, I'll get the line numbers corrected so that they don't show up like that. Thank you very much.
Oops. Are you going to be presenting the, the fiscal year 19 budget calendar? Yes, I will. So in your packet, we had the FY19 budget calendars. And during the week of December 4th, all district administrators uh, met with myself and the superintendent to discuss the FY19 budget process. And then last week, we met with the principals uh, individually. And in those meetings with the principals, we had our SPED director, we had our um, IT director, we had our facilities, our, our pre-K curriculum, our early, our regular Louise sat in, and our high school one. So we met one-on-one -on -one with the principals and we did, they discussed their, their, their wants and their dreams. And um, right now we're taking all that information, we're rolling the salaries forward, <clears throat> and we will be presenting our first initial budget um, in on, G on, our e um, on the evening of January 16th, which will be our first meeting. Um, February 6th, we will continue with our budget deliberations. Sometime February or March, we usually get called by the town to come present. And then March 20th, um, you will hold your public hearing. And after that, you will deliberate and vote a budget. Uh, the town meeting, I believe, is scheduled for Friday, April 27th, with your elections on May 5th. Uh, and these dates will, could fluctuate, hopefully not a lot, um, depending on, um, you know, usually the only thing at this point that keeps us off these dates are meetings or uh, snow dates. <laughs> so that is the calendar. Is that fairly similar to last year? Yes. Do you have one the first? <coughs> Pardon? Do you have the first budget subcommittee? They're, the, they are discussing that <coughs> at Frontier right now. Right now. Okay. It will be the first week of January okay. for the Frontier budget. <coughs> and there's uh, no vote required right. on that, Mr. Groucho. Indeed. All right. And any reports? Um, I, I do have, um, the principal sent you a report, but there's just a couple of dates I want to, I'd like to read out loud for the public um, to remind them that this Friday, December 22nd, we are, it is a half day. Uh, we will be on holiday break, um, but before we come back from holiday break, there is the annual snowflake skate on January 1st at 6 p.m., and I believe that takes place at UMass. So uh, I just wanted to read those aloud for uh, Principal Barshevsky so people will know um, before our next meeting that those events are taking place. Outstanding. And I don't have a report from the superintendent. Well, if anyone else has I think it's a uh, motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. We're adjourned. <laughs> oh, you get the